just the teacher pastor in there. And we may not be perfect here, but we're going to stick close to the scripture. Yeah. If we decide we're going, everybody wants to go another way, I'm going to go another way. Call to the house. Life is too important. Our job of representing God in this world is too important. Preaching the gospel, doing the work of the minister, carrying out the Great Commission is too important to play games. And I don't know about you, but I'm at that point in life now where I've passed a lot more road markers than I have in front of me. When I think about that, it makes me even more serious about this thing. When I think about my grandkids, it makes me even more serious about this thing. But it's time. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here because everybody here, hopefully, is on or on page for this, is in Christ, is fully devoted to Christ. That's what I hope. But there's a lot out there who aren't. And there's a lot of people around you who aren't. And part of what we have to do is share with them the truth. And don't buy into this thing, well, if that's what you want, then I guess that's it. That's not true. All right, so number two, we must remain fully engaged followers of Christ. Number three, apologetics must become a mainstream part of our lives and not just a sideline topic. Apologetics is the ability to give a defense of the faith. You're not apologizing for it, but you're giving a defense for it. So it's, it's doing the work so if someone asks you a question, you can give them an answer other than, I don't know. Because there's a lot of questions out there people have about God, life, truth, and so forth. And especially in a postmodern culture where they've been told there is no truth. So we have, to, and there's great ministries out there to help with this. Um, just if you want to know, I can tell you. Apologetics has got to become a mainstream part of our lives. We can't just settle for a few Bible studies or devotionals anymore. Number three, or number four, remember that secularism, which is what we're up against, secularism is just the belief that life is better without God. That you can do it on your own, you don't need anybody, and, and so it just tries to get God out. Remember, the message of secularism boasts many things that cannot produce meaning and purpose. I'll give you an example of that. I recently listened to a, a book written by an entertainer who I enjoy. Um, not, that's my confession. I enjoy his music. But anyway, that has nothing to do with this. But I listened to his biography. And um, he made this statement, and it stuck with me. He talked about growing up, and he said, you know, if I, had, if I had to describe my relationship to God, I would call it, I'm an envious agnostic. Envious agnostic. And let me see if I can help explain that. He said he was raised in a family of scientists and medical doctors. His family believed that there was a God. He was distant and detached from the world, which is deism. Still, the family often attended the liberal mainline church more to maintain an image while they lived in the South. The man said all he ever got out of church was an appreciation for finance. Ironically, now he's in his senior years and describes himself as an envious 
agnostic. Meaning, he does not believe in God, but he envies those who do. Let that settle in. Covers a lot of my head. Because secularism promises the world it can't do anything but the world. It can't do anything about purpose and meaning. He, he is trapped in his own unbelief. He can't. He wants to believe in something greater than this world, but he cannot bring himself to do so. His secularist view of life, though, has not paid off very well. In fact, I've seen it yet to pay off very well for anyone. For him, he and all of his siblings became addicts. He and all of his siblings spent time in mental institutions. His older brother OD. The entertainer sold him out. Primarily because he almost died. And several of his friends did. Sobriety was a, allowing him now to function as a husband and a father. But he was still a baby. See, this is a man who needs to hear the true gospel, not cultural Christianity. Last one. Be confident in the truth. We don't have to shrink back and say, well, you know, they don't agree with me on this, and I'm not really sure I can back it up. Be confident in the truth. Be confident in the truth. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. That's the truth. There's many truths out there. We, we have to be confident in it because the truth is always going to come out on top. So my closing word would be this. Regardless of what happens in the future, God is still on the throne. Amen. Nothing's happened that he didn't see. Nothing's happened that he didn't allow. I really think that what's ahead of us is we're going to see a further separation between true biblical Christianity and cultural Christianity. I feel for those who are on the side of cultural Christianity because eventually they're going to have to make a choice. As the demands for them to totally compromise everything with Christian faith increase, eventually they have to make a choice. The fence is gone. So, be of good cheer. Be like Isaiah. See God sitting on the throne. Because he's still there. And heaven's still full of his glory. And he works everything out for the good of those. All things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to so if that's you, you have a promise. And I'll tell you one thing that's going to come out of all this, a pure bride. Might be a smaller bride, but it's going to be a pure bride. Yeah, it's going to lose some weight. Uh, shed a few pounds here and there. But it's going to happen. Because that's the kind of bride he's coming back to. And don't lose heart when you see people who decide they no longer want to be part of that. Because some people are going to discover when the heat builds that they were never saved to start with. Or some are going to discover they were converted to something but it wasn't the true gospel. And they didn't buy into this. They didn't sign on to this. Alright? 
So we're going to be of good cheer. Yes. We're going to hold on to the promise. Yes. We're going to step up like Isaiah and say, I'll go send me. I'll tell people the truth. Send me. I'll do that. Before we pray and close, I just want to thank our guests for being with us today. You're probably wondering where in the world have I been? <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you coming back. Please. We're not always like this. Sometimes we're funny. <laughs> the serious times call for serious response. Amen. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, that you are still on the throne. You haven't forgotten how to work miracles, that you are still in the process of purifying your bride. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to work in us and among us. We thank you for all that you have done now, like in that uh, report of healing today. And we pray, Father, that that will continue. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, our guests today who have come with us, and, and Lord, I pray that uh, they'll find this to be a place that they would like to return. And Father, I just pray most of all for every person that's here today, for their families. I pray that they will experience your peace like they've never known it before, and they will have a hope for the future. And Lord, I just pray that you will prosper them and they'll be in health as their souls prosper. Amen. See you next week. Hope you have a blessed week. Stay safe.